Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, 3 through 6. Ephesians 5, 3 through 6 for our sermon text. Actually, I'm going to back up into verses 1 and 2 to get us started. I know Pastor Ben covered those last week, but we're going to read those with our text to give the context. So let's follow along as I read. It says the word of the Lord. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. The Lord has spoken. Let's pray once more. Gracious God, we pray that we would see your glory, that we would see Christ, and you would show us how to live in response to your great love, the love that you showed us in sending Jesus, the love that Jesus showed in going willingly to the cross to pay for sin. May our response be one of trust and obedience because you are worthy and because you've made us new. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. A few years ago, I was invited to share the gospel at a Christmas luncheon for a for a lighting company, a Christian lighting company here in uh, the area in Dallas-Fort Worth, Boss Lighting, maybe you've heard of them. They asked me to come and, and share the gospel at, at a luncheon where they had invited several of their vendors to get some free food, eat some fajitas, and they were also going to demonstrate some of their new products that they wanted to highlight for these vendors. And as different salesmen stepped up to the front to talk shop about different aspects of lighting technology, it became very obvious to me that I had entered into a different world. <laughs> I did not know the lingo. I did not know the abbreviations. I did not know the acronyms at all, whatsoever. It was a completely different language, and I had stepped into it, and I was trying to grasp a few words here and there as they were speaking. But what do you do? Eventually just go back to dressing up your fajita taco <laughs> and eating. Because I didn't understand what they were saying. It was a different language. It was a different world it felt like to me. And if I had not been there to share the gospel, I would not have contributed to that meeting at all whatsoever. I would have just simply taken their food different world. I felt like I didn't fit. I didn't know what they were talking about. I felt like I was out of place. Now, they were very kind. They were very loving and gracious. But because of the fact that I didn't understand what was going on, I felt like I was out of place. That reminds me of what we encounter here in this text. See, because there are things that ought to be out of place in a believer's life. There are things that don't fit with our new identity. There are behaviors, there are ways of speaking and thinking that uh, don't fit. They're not suited for, they're not proper when it comes to who we have been made in Christ the new self we've been talking about along the way. 
we have to ask ourselves, are we engaging in behavior or using speech that is out of place, improper, not suited for the new identity that Christ has given us? We have moved into the more practical half of Ephesians, as you know. As Paul is he's telling us what it means to live out this new identity that we have in Christ so that we can put God on display in this world, in his cosmic theater. Last week, Pastor Ben helped us understand that we are to be imitators of God. And certainly we can be imitators of God because the new self that we have been given, verse 24 of chapter 4 says, that it is created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. We can imitate our God as new creations in Jesus. Last week, Pastor Ben showed us, as we are being told, how we need to live out our new identity. Pastor Ben showed us that Paul doesn't get too far, again, without anchoring these commands in the gospel. He anchors them in the gospel. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Live this way because your Savior has given himself for you. He has sacrificed himself. He's gone to the cross willingly in obedience to his Father's commands and out of love for you, he's gone. So be like him. This morning, we're gonna see that Paul continues to call us to live lives as those who have put on the new self, but we should remember never to divorce this lifestyle from the reality that Jesus went to the cross out of love for us. So today, today Paul is, is telling us, he's telling us what a proper life looks like among saints. We are saints we are the ones who have been set apart in Christ. We've been separated from our old self, separated from the world, set apart. And so there is a certain lifestyle we're called to, and there are things that don't fit. There are activities, there are sins. They don't fit in our new lives. They're not consistent with the new self. So if we're gonna live this life that fits our new nature, our new self, then Paul calls us to obey three commands. Number one, don't serve yourself. Number two, instead give thanks. And number three, don't be deceived. Okay, those three, don't serve yourself, instead give thanks, and don't be deceived. Number one is found in verses three and four, don't serve yourself. Look with me there again, and I'll read those verses. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking which are out of place. That's where we're going to start. There are several sins here, six in fact, but let's look at the, the first batch in this list of six. We find those in verse three. The first one is sexual immorality. These things that ought to be put off, that are out of place for saints. Sexual immorality. Now, this word in the Greek is a general word used to describe all sexual activity outside of heterosexual marriage. It's a general term that encompasses all of that. It's prohibition against adultery, premarital sex, homosexuality, incest, pedophilia, and other practices that God considers vile. And this is a crucial command. It's a crucial command for the Ephesians because they actually live in a very sexualized culture. In their cultural context, it is very much like ours. Actually, I would say worse. This is what Clinton Arnold, New Testament professor, says about the cultural context of the Ephesians. He says, there was not an accepted social standard with regard to sexual relations. You can imagine it was worse for them than it is for us today. But this is a prohibition against 
All that is outside of God's design for marriage and sexuality, inside that covenant of marriage that he has deemed right and good and creating it. We need these straightforward, objective commands in our culture because our culture celebrates sexual deviance. Celebrates. It doesn't just accept it, but celebrates it. But brothers and sisters, God is the ultimate authority as the one who actually created sex. He gets to tell us what it is for, how it is to be used and pursued. He gets to define that because he created it. And he created you and he created me. He gets to say what is right and wrong in this area of life, what should be celebrated, and what should be condemned as sin. We must understand that God is not against pleasure. Hear me say that. Because we have this idea, I think, when we think of God, that he, he is the cosmic killjoy in the sky. He's against pleasure somehow. That, that, that's the lie that we believe, but it's not true. God is against empty, wicked pleasure that is found outside of his will. That's what he's against, but not pleasure. Actually, he knows how you and I work best because he made us. And he made us to reflect him. He made us to walk in his ways, and he certainly saved us to that end as well. So we need to trust him. I heard a kind of a, a, a Christian worldview commentator talking about this very issue in our day, the sexual immorality. And he was talking about the fact that God, yes, does prohibit everything outside of heterosexual marriage in terms of sexuality. But in prohibiting all of those things and saying no to all of those things, what's he doing? He's actually upholding what is right and good about sexuality and saying, here, this is how I designed it. Here's how you should pursue it in, in this context. And there is great pleasure and joy when you do things my way for my glory. Trust me. Yes, he's prohibiting these things, but he's upholding this and saying, this is better. It's right and good. And this is where true pleasure is found as you pursue it my way for my glory. And with us to trust in his ways and then we will taste and see that he is good as we do so. That's sexual immorality. The next sin on the list is impurity. That's the word that we see here in the English translation in our ESV. Impurity, which is uncleanness or you, you could say filthiness. One author said this about this word in particular that most of the times that this word is used in the New Testament, it, it is also associated with sexual sins. He said, it's immoral thoughts, passions, ideas, fantasies, and every other form of sexual corruption. So it's general, not so much the, the activities as what goes on in the inside when it comes to lust and the things that go along with it in terms of sexual corruption. He says that it is something on the inside, primarily. We're called to flee from more than sexually immoral activities. Not just the activities, but what goes on in the inside. We're to flee lust and impurity on the inside. At the level of our thinking, at the level of our desires, we are to pursue purity as well. We don't just say no to the activities, but also the sins that, that are on the inside because those, those sins, those lusts and those passions and that corruption on the inside moves out into activities, doesn't it? And we must refuse, brothers and sisters, to believe the lie that as long as we keep our outside clean, it doesn't matter what goes on on the inside. That's a lie. It all matters to God, the one who is supremely important. Proverbs 4.23 in the ESV, it says it like this. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Another translation says this. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. 
Guard it because it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, determine the direction of your life. So guard your heart, not just your behavior, but your heart. What's on the inside will direct what you do on the outside. Now, something very practical for us in our day and age is how this sin of impurity that we're talking about applies to the sin of pornography use. You might say, well, I'm not engaging in sex outside of marriage. So you think it's really not that bad. Well, that's not how God sees it, though. That's not how God sees it. Pornography is a rejection of God's design for sexuality. And I want to be frank for a moment. If you are here this morning, or if you're listening to my voice online, if you're looking at pornography, I have three things I want to say to you. The first one is this. The God who made you and loves you is offended and he's displeased. He hates pornography, and so should you. What you are doing is not okay. Number two, Jesus died to pay for that sin too. Jesus died to pay for that sin as well. Every lustful look. If you belong to Christ, then, then he was punished for that sin as well. You're forgiven if you have trusted in the Savior. You're forgiven of that sin as well. So return to God again in humble gratitude for the atoning sacrifice of his son. And remember, Jesus died to save you from these sins and to give you grace, the grace necessary for you to flee from this sin. So turn from porn today and trust God's design for sex. His grace is sufficient for you to choose him as your source of pleasure. Number three, your church family is here to help you. If this is true of you, then please reach out to one of the elders of this church. Reach out to another member of this congregation so that we can help you bear this burden, so that we can walk alongside you and help you to walk in the joy of your master and your savior. Please reach out. The next sin that Paul lists is covetousness. If you see there, verse three, covetousness, which is greed. It's an insatiable hunger for more. I just want more. It's like Proverbs 27, verse 20 says, never satisfied are the eyes of man. You see it, you gotta have it. That's us left to our sin, isn't it? See it, I gotta have it. In context, this probably includes sexual greed, but it's, it's not limited to that. Possessions are likely included here in terms of covetousness as well. Materials. It's also important for us to note what Paul says about covetousness in verse five as well, if you look with me there. He says that someone who is covetous is an idolater. An idolater. So when you are greedy for more of something, then you have put that something on the throne of your heart. You've put that something on the seat of your affections. In that moment, you are not worshiping God. You're worshiping that thing. You're not craving God. You're craving that thing, that person, that experience. In our greed, we commit idolatry, don't we? That's what he means. And so covetousness is a worship problem. It's a worship problem, meaning the object of your worship is misplaced. So this sin is more serious than we realize. Do you see how these sins are really the opposite of walking in love? We were commanded to walk in love as Christ, but these sins are really the opposite of walking in love. If you think about it, listen, these sins are all about taking aren't they? Taking for yourself instead of giving of yourself like Christ gave himself for us. They're taking sins. They're not giving like we're called to in our new lives in Christ. And he says here of these sins, they must not even be named among you, verse 3. 
must not even be named among you. Paul is saying that onlookers should not be able to point out these sins among believers. No one should be able to accuse us of these things, is the idea. I like what the Christian Standard Bible says uh, with that same uh, verse, that, part, that portion of verse three. These things should not even be heard of among you, it says. The NIV says they should not even be, there should not be a hint of these things among you. I've seen my fair share of Major League Baseball and something that you may recognize, even if you're not a, a huge baseball fan, is that it's pretty rare for a baseball player to miss a pop fly. You ever notice that? Now, if you're watching a little league game, it happens all the time, right? Let's just be honest. But in a major league baseball game, it is rare to see them drop or miss a pop fly in the outfield. But yet, as I was in a store waiting on uh, some customer service the other day, I was watching ESPN. There was a TV that was on, and sure enough, there was an outfielder that had his glove up, and the ball went right past his glove and hit him right in the kisser. Why is it? it, it it's rare that that happens. So when it happens, we, can, we, we take notice, don't we? Because it doesn't often happen. It seems so out of place among people who are being paid millions of dollars to catch a ball. <laughs> we don't expect it, do we? It's shocking when we see it because it's not something that characterizes them, their professionals. So that kind of error doesn't sit well. And these kinds of sins ought not sit well with us. It shouldn't, there shouldn't be a hint of these things. Now, praise the Lord, there's forgiveness when there are hints of these things, but there should not be. He's calling us away from this. It's proper for saints to be set apart, actually, right? That's the, the word saints. It's that idea. We're called saints, and so we're set apart by Christ, set apart for his service, set apart from our old life to live this new life. We're to be separated from the world and the lives we used to live. And so... We ought to flee sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness. By his grace, by the power of his spirit, flee. They should not be named among us. In verse four, three other sins are listed. Filthiness, foolish talk, and crude joking. These are um, most likely all referring to kinds of sinful speech. Sinful speech. Filthiness here is speech as one commentator says, that is obscene. Speech that is shameful. Foolish talk could be called speech that is uh, empty and senseless. It's, it's moronic speech even. Then there's crude joking, which is, I like what Clinton Arnold says here. He says, crude joking is wit in connection with lewdness. Wit in connection with lewdness. So think of innuendo, using your wit to be filthy and corrupt and using it for innuendo, speech that comes from a mind that's in the gutter. It's out of place. See that, that terminology that Paul uses there? It's, it's out of place, verse four. This kind of speech does not belong among the other words and sentences that we as God's people speak because we've been made new, haven't we? We have a new heart. We have new inclinations, new abilities. We have the spirit within us. It ought not to be this way. When God makes us alive in Christ, one of the most evident changes is often a believer's speech. You ever notice that in people who have been saved? You, you, you recognize that their speech patterns and the words they use change, oftentimes drastically. There's a brother yesterday in, in men's ministry that highlighted how the Lord had changed him. See, before he came to Christ, he was in the military, and he said that a military officer once told him that he cursed too much. And so we, we I kind of had to laugh at that, right? Because we know this man, and we, we know the kind of person he is. And we know how the Lord has changed him and, and made him new and sanctified him. And so 
Before, what was out of place was clean speech. But now what's out of place is filthy speech for this brother. Family, are we taking sin seriously? Obviously, God takes it seriously. So seriously, in fact, that he sent his son to save you from it. It took the very sacrifice of the son of God to save you from your sins. God takes sin seriously. So much so that he delivered up his son for us. We also should take sin seriously. God did not save us so that we would stay the same. Are we living as if sin is out of place among us? Or is it at home among us is the question. Is that at home there? Is it, does it fit in just fine? Are we increasingly uncomfortable with it? Are we pleading for God to lead us out of it? Are we asking for help from the body of Christ so that we can not have these things be named among us? Our a new lifestyle should fit our new identity in Jesus. And God has given us everything we need for it in Jesus. Remember chapter four, verse 24, the new self is created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. So we can be imitators of God now. We can. We can put him on display in this cosmic theater so that he gets glory. We need to obey these commands in order to highlight God. And you know what? God's speech is always pure. And his activities are always generous, aren't they? And so as we fall in line with these things obediently by his grace, then we are putting his character on display. Praise him. Number two, as we're thinking about these commands that are calling us to uh, a proper life, right? A life that fits our new identity. Number two, we should instead give thanks. It's a little part of verse four there, right? All these sins are out of place. And then he says at the end of verse four, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Let there be thanksgiving. The last point covered putting off sin. This covers putting on putting on something that is good and right that God wants from us. In the verses three and four, where we're told to put off six different sins, now we just have this one, this this one virtue to put on, and it's thanksgiving. It seems like an odd substitution, doesn't it? When we think about those six sins that we just listed, it seems like an odd substitution, especially considering the sexual nature of so many of those sins in Paul's list. Why should giving thanks be the replacement for sexual immorality and and impurity and covetousness and crude joking? Listen to what Pastor Richard Koken says. The antidote to us indulging in our self-serving lust for sexual immorality, licentious impurity, or acquisitive greed is to recognize the true worth of what our loving heavenly father has already given us rather than lusting for what he hasn't given us. I think he's on to something here. I think he's on to something here because all of the sins from verses three and four that we saw are inherently self-focused, aren't they? They're inherently self-serving, aren't they? What I want what I think I need more of, what I think is funny to get the laughs that I want. But when we begin to give thanks, when we begin to be grateful and express that gratitude to God, then we're focusing on God, aren't we? We're not focusing on ourselves anymore. We're focusing on the one who is worthy, the one who loves us, the one who saved us by the blood of his son. He becomes our focus when we give thanks. And you begin to see just how foolish it is to live like you know what's best or to live like you have what what you don't have is is what you need so badly. Remember what we're told in the word of God so that we can remember to give thanks 
instead of engage in, in covetousness or, or lust or sexual immorality. Remember Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I like what some of the other translations say. The Lord is my shepherd, I have what I need. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Do you believe that? So that you're guarded from greed when it comes to material possessions or greed when it comes to sexual immorality. Remember what we saw back in Ephesians chapter one, right? Blessed, well, we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly places. God has made it so we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Do you believe it? Or do you still need more? But if you start thinking about these things and unpacking these things, then you can start seeing all the different ways in which you can give thanks and have your heart directed to God instead of yourself. Remember what Psalm 103 verse two says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Tell your soul, don't forget what he's done. Bless him and don't forget how he has blessed you. And pour it out upon you all that you need in Christ and all that you need for your physical life so that you can be faithful to him. I think it's important that it's, it's not just here, remember what you have. It's not just here, bring to mind what you have been given in Christ but it's give thanks because giving thanks is more than just remembering your blessings. It's, it's more than just counting your blessings. Giving thanks moves beyond remembrance to directly worshiping God for all of the blessings that he poured out on you. That's important. It's actually worship, isn't it? Giving thanks is worship. It's not just, oh yeah, I need to be grateful for that. Yes, I need to be grateful for that. But it's t seeing those things and then actively going to God and saying, thank you. Thank you. It's worship. Instead of worshiping yourself, instead of you taking these idols that you think you, you need so badly and exalting them to the place of your affections, the, the, the throne of your heart, then you're thanking God and saying, you're the one that is on the throne of my heart. You're the one who's given me everything I need. You have lavished your grace upon me. God becomes the focus this worship is vastly important because as we saw, covetousness is idolatry. We're going to worship, aren't we? We all worship. Everybody in the world worships. But the question is, who or what are you going to worship? Remembering how God has blessed us helps us to give thanks to him and thus worship him instead of anyone or anything else. So think of it practically with me for a moment. The next time you are tempted toward sexual lust or you detect your heart beginning to covet something that, that you do not have, the way to respond is not simply to tell yourself, no. Oh yes, you, you can start there. Tell yourself, no. No, uh, but if you stay there, if you just say no or just stop it, have you ever noticed how that just keeps you thinking about the thing that you need to stop? You say no to yourself and stop it, and you're still thinking about it. Yeah, maybe you're thinking of it in negative terms, but it's still there. You're still thinking about that thing. No, you, you've got to replace the temptation with a different focus. And God must be that focus. So if you are tempted toward those sins, what you can do, just practically speaking, you, you can sit down and you can make a list. Just start making a list. Sometimes you need to put pen to paper, don't you? Sometimes that helps me concentrate and focus because I can be so scatterbrained. I need to take my pen and say, okay, what is it that he's done for me? Start writing it down so you can focus. And then what you need to do after that is when you, you have that list, then you actively praise him and thank him for the things he's done for you in Jesus. Maybe you need to go outside. Maybe you're tempted toward these sins and you recognize it in your heart and you just need to get up and go outside and look at the beauty of creation. Maybe you need to go look at the trees and the sky. Maybe you need to go and look at your family members and, and, and be grateful for them, things that God has blessed you with so you have tangible evidence of his love for you. And then actively thank God and focus on him for being so kind to you. Maybe you need to begin to rehearse the gospel as a, as a daily habit. 
You can go to the word of God and, and you know what? Well, if you go and start reading through Ephesians chapter one and chapter two, We've seen all of the things that God has done for us, all these spiritual blessings in the heavenly places that have been done for us. I mean, it's just chock full of all these blessings. You can take it and just read. And as you encounter another blessing, thank you, God. As you encounter another blessing, praise your name. You gave this to me. I couldn't give it to myself. Only you can. You're worthy. Are you beginning to see how giving thanks is the right replacement for these sins? Giving thanks to the Lord? We need Focus on him in all the ways that his grace has been manifested in our lives in order for us to turn from sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness and filthiness, crude joking. Well, finally, point number three, a lifestyle that fits our new identity also means not being deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Deceived by what? Look with me at the text. Let's look at verses five and six. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is, who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So, don't be deceived. What he means is don't be deceived into thinking that those who persist in these sins without repentance will be saved from God's wrath. Those who live in such sin, who are characterized by such sin, do not share in the inheritance of the kingdom of God. And the wrath of God is promised instead for those who live in sin unrepentantly. Now, this might be confusing. You may be thinking, but, but why does Paul bring this warning to those who are believers, those who are safe from God's wrath, because we believe that the word of God is very clear, that God saves sinners and those whom he has saved, he preserves them for eternity because of his grace in Christ. He preserves them for eternity. So what do we, what do, we do to understand Paul is saying? Now listen, it is, it's absolutely true that, that we will persevere because he's preserving us by his grace. We will get to the end. We'll get to eternity because of him. But listen, I, I, I take the interpretation that why Paul is doing this, why he's bringing this warning is because one of the ways that God preserves us is through warnings. I think that's one of the ways that he preserves his people is through giving us these kinds of warnings. It's like those signs around Mansfield, all right? When it, when, whenever uh, we, we come down over the, close to the railroad tracks here on, on North Street and we're going kind of close to downtown, if you're, you ever go that way, then there's that sign that says, um, turn around, don't drown. Because, because it gets really flooded there whenever it rains a lot. And so it's dangerous, right? And so God uses warnings like that one to keep us following Christ. Those who have a new identity in Christ, they heed those warnings. They, they heed those warnings because they've been made new. Now, and listen, and for those among us who don't yet know the saving, preserving love of God, these warnings can be used by God to send them fleeing to Christ, can be used to send them fleeing to the Savior so that they will have that eternal rescue for their souls through his death and resurrection. But for those who live their lives seeking to gain the pleasure of the world's distorted sexuality or the gain of more and more possessions that will only burn in the end, and that's what fuels them and drives them, and there is unrepentance, and what they think is gain is only loss in God's economy. What they think is gain is only loss in God's economy. Look with me at Luke chapter 9, 23 and 24. Jesus says, he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now listen, for whoever would save his life 
will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Your definition of true life, your definition of the good life, your def definition of, of what life is all about, if you give up that, you, you will find in Christ true life, abundant life, eternal life. But when we choose when we trust our hearts and live by that and follow our hearts, and that's what characterizes us, then there's loss. You'll lose that life. But there's true life when we say, I forsake my idea of the good life because I want to find it in Jesus. Maybe you need to hear that this morning. But if you are in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you, if you have come to believe in Christ as Savior, then know this. Your God loves you. He loves you more than you'll ever realize. It is a love that is without limit, and nothing can separate you from that love. It's true. Because of that love, don't let these sins be named among you. Because of that love, don't, don't let these, these sins mark your life. Pray that God would help you to flee. Pray that he would lead you into thanksgiving. Pray and ask for help from your, your, your church body, your congregation, because that's what we're here for. We're, we're one of the avenues of grace that God has given you so that you can live the life he's called you to live and enjoy him as you do so and commune with him as you stay on his path. And praise the Lord. When we step off, there's forgiveness and there's grace to get back on. He's good. Ow. Let's pray and ask for help in this regard. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this passage. We thank you, Lord God, that you, you've given us what we need in our new self to choose to forsake these sins and to choose rather the giving of thanks so that our focus is not on self but on you. Lord, we, we can't obey apart from you. So please, give us the grace we need and may we take the next step. And Lord, thank you that Jesus gave himself so that we can walk in love as we look to him as our savior and as our, our example. We ask that you answer these prayers in his name, by his spirit, amen.